Welcome to the year 1987, fellow Viator. At the end of that year, a series by the name Final Fantasy was born. A series well known by nearly all of us. Here's where it all started, so completely different from what it became. We will experience this game in its original Famicom version, translated via patch file and run on a Retron 5 console. We start with the creation of our four light warriors and the rough part of coming up with a name for them. I don't remember anything from my first playthrough roughly 10 years ago, but I tend to like mages, so we will have two of them in our group. Even if that means a bit slower progression with standard mobs, thanks to MP shortages. Unlike another December release we just finished, this game offers no big introduction. We spawn right here, with this large castle in front of us, and how beautiful it looks. The obvious road leads us right in front of this world's king. He's already waiting for us, as according to Lucan's prophecy, we will come forth to rescue his kidnapped daughter, Princess Sarah, from the evil Garland. If you saw my other videos, this will sound very, very similar to you. Ahem, <laughs> Dragon Quest. Ahem. <laughs> but let's see if we can get a bit more information on the matter by investigating the castle. According to the stuff, Garland once was a good knight, but then an unknown event changed him long ago. Rumors report that he took Princess Sarah to the Chaos Shrine in the north, so I guess we know where we need to go. As every good castle should, this one has two treasure rooms with sparkly stuff in it, but they are locked away from us with a mystical key. Dang it. Story goes that the key was given to an elf king 400 years ago. The elf king is supposed to keep it till the day of the arrival of our four light warriors. The city around this enormous castle is called Cornelia, the city of dreams. We come in touch with a legend regarding the sage Lucan, leaving this city in ancient times, traveling towards the crescent moon. If that does not sound like a fairy tale, then what would? To us, Cornelia offers the first option of buying equipment. The base gear is thankfully fairly cheap and saves us enough money to spend it on a spell or two. Yep, you heard that right. Apparently that's the thing here, we have to pay for the knowledge of spellcasting. Furthermore, the system limits our mages with three spells for each spell level, though there are four available per such level, so we will have to sacrifice one. With our current fund, we will run with a fire and a cure spell, one for each of our casters. As there is not much choice of where to go, let's follow the landmass. Exploring the surroundings of the castle will throw us into the first fights. Let me tell you, fighting is a bit tiring here for being this tardily, but at least we get 4 cute animated sprites up to 9 enemy sprites in one screen, plus a little hint of a background scene. As I did not experience this time area firsthand, I cannot estimate how much performance this took from the original Famicom, 
but judging based on all this loading, it appears to be quite heavy on the machine. By the way, dying results in a game over screen and the loss of all unsafe progress, including all gathered XP. Dragon Quest was really soft on us in this regard. By testing the system a little, our four heroes will gain their first level. And oh boy, this is a little nightmare. The progress just takes so long, especially if all four level at once. Leveling, though, makes them strong enough to endure a few battles in a row without the need to recover. Thanks to this, they can reach this ruin in the north. The way leads us straight into a chamber with lots of statues, beds, and a princess? Oh! This is Garland! The one we went out for? Are we really about to fight him in the here and now? That's unexpected. Are we supposed to win this? We're dealing regular damage on him at least. Garland's hit misses us, and we win with a lucky critical hit from Dan, our fighter. Princess Sarah thanks us for rescuing her, and we are returned to the castle. Wait, what? Really? Here we get a loot from Princess Sarah, an item which is passed down from generation to generation among the princesses. Garland stole it from her, but now it is ours. The king honors us with praise, but of course no credits roll for beating the evil Garland. Instead, the king induces the build of a bridge in the north. Our new mission seems to be to bring the crystals across the land to the former glory. If we now speak to the people living in this castle again, we get new responses. That's new. Most simply thank us for the rescue of the princess, including her mother and sister. But we also get an information regarding the loot we got from Princess Sarah. It conceals the power of shattering the gateway of evil, even though I not really know what to do with this info. Since we got different responses here, let's return to the City of Dreams and re-speak to the people there. There is an old lady here, speaking of a witch by the name Matoya in the north. And this citizen speaks of another location in the far east, a harbor city named Pravoka. Do you see this? This must be the bridge the king constructed for us. Stepping onto it triggers a surprise. The intro of the game starts rolling. Our heroes seem as stumbling as we are, not knowing of what is to become. Ordered to bring back the light of the crystals and pushing evil away. 
as our main quest. Exploring north through a thick forest and around the arms of a river is a cave located. An amazing thing awaits us in here. An enchanted mob sweeping through the hallway. The witch controlling this one and a bunch of others is missing a crystal eye, enabling her to see. Someone stole it from her, but who might steal such a thing? Since there isn't a thing we can do for her now, we say goodbye to the dancing mobs and leave towards the east. Exploring north through a thick forest and around the arms of a river is a cave located. An amazing thing awaits us in here. An enchanted mob sweeping through the hallway. The witch controlling this one and a bunch of others is missing a crystal eye, enabling her to see. Someone stole it from her, but who might steal such a thing? Since there isn't a thing we can do for her now, we say goodbye to the dancing mobs and leave towards the east. The way east appears long and dangerous. New enemies appear. Some of them even inflict poison onto the group. The effect causes damage per turn, which is not that high, but it also remains even when the battle is over, dealing damage on each step mate. It's nasty, and only can be cured via purchase of an antidote. But with a bunch of these and some potions, we are able to set foot into the port town Provoca. I think it's amazing how different this place feels from Cornelia, the city of dreams. But strange, ain't it? There are so few people on the streets. Speaking to the first reveals why, I straight run into a pirate crew, led by this beaky guy. There are nine of them. A bit unfair, don't you agree? But it appears they are more for show than a real threat, as my little healer here knocks one of them out in just this one turn. The rest of them fought as simple as the first, defeating them one after another till all nine are beaten and we find this great pirate beaker, regretting his actions and gifting us, as atonement, with a ship. Ships seem to have been a popular gift in these times. In Fantasy Star we needed to work for them, but on the NES we continue to get them gifted. 
With the pirates' pacification, the other town members dare to step outside of their houses again. Among them is a woman speaking of elves living across the sea, with a prince which is asleep for many years by now. Wasn't there a story of an elf king guarding the mystical key? Which keeps us from rob- mm, I mean, entering the treasure room at the castle? It might pay off to go and find this prince. From the old man on the west wing of this poor town, who definitely isn't naked, we learn of another village, Melmont. Melmont lies in the west and suffers currently a big crisis. The earth is rotting and monsters wander through the streets at night, attacking people. As light warriors, we should definitely do something about it once we get there. Leaving Provoca, we find our brand new, well, for us at least, <laughs> pirate ship. For you, there's probably nothing special about it. But for me, the way the ship hops over the waves is just adorable. But, as to be expected, this won't be a peaceful travel. Monsters like these constantly interrupt us for a fight. Nevertheless, fights are not as frequent on the ocean as they are on land, ensuring a faster way of travel. Hopping along the shore, we will soon figure out that we are enclosed by a giant landmass with no way of escape. Well, at least this means we cannot get lost too easily, right? Making this discovery, we also come across two additional ports on which we can park our ship. Unlike previous games, we can only land if we put our ship on a leash at these ports. So let's start exploring clockwise, which would mark this one in the south our starting point. Close by the port and surrounded by this fake forest hides this castle. And all the guys who live here are probably elves. Exploring the fortification, we soon get into its center and enter the room of their prince. THE elf prince, who is asleep for five whole years by now. His subordinate, the one guarding his sleep, pleads our four to help against Astor's curse. The medicine from the witch Matoya might be the cure to this, but, well, guess we won't get any help from her unless we recover her missing eye. The town attached to the castle is embedded in nature and filled with shops to buy new spells from. Up to level 4 for both types of casters. The prices for them have exploded though, and we need to save up if we want to equip our heroes with them. The elves living here tell us that Astos, the one who put their prince to sleep, is the king of the Dark Elves, and if their prince doesn't wake up, no heir will be born, and their kind will be ruled by the Dark Elves. No one seems to know, though, where this Astos of the Dark Elves is hiding. The next site we should try to find is a lone castle that was discovered by one of the elves in town by accident and which gave him the creeps. As I often am, if someone tells me to go west, I'll go east. 
just to make sure we don't miss a thing. But this time, there's nothing here. Okay then, let's follow the advice and go west. First we will follow the coastline into the mountains, which are overgrown with a deep forest, and naturally, plenty of monsters who prey on us. Exploring this area rewards our team with a level or two before we find the lone castle described to us. What do you think we will find in there? Shall we go and find out? At first glance, the castle really appears all emptied out except for all the bats that made it their home. The first room I wanted to open is already locked. Damn! <laughs> but what about the one in the center? It's not. <laughs> It's a throne room, and there is someone here, the presumable king of this domain. He also suffers from Astor scheming. His castle got ruined by him, and unless our four recover the stolen crown from the marshland caves in the south, he can't rebuild it. As light warriors, I guess it's our duty to take care of the matter. While exploring the forest within the mountains, I already stumbled into a dark and creepy place in the south. <sighs> Seems we cannot avoid it. It's filled to the brim with zombies and ghasts. So this time around I prepared my white mage June by educating her with the Diara spell. A spell which is supposed to damage the undead, and multiple at once. In order to reach the cave, we need to cross a marshland with these new creatures. Inviting, right? They use paralyzing attacks, which are really frustrating me. Because of them, already long fights are even more tiring and more dangerous on top of it as a paralyzed character can't do a thing. Inside this hole waits the dungeon of origins of those types of monsters and additional slimes and skeletons. Despite my repulsion, if we want to make progress, we will need to bring this cave behind us. At least, June's Diara spell works great with the zombies and skeletons. So does Vivi's Fire spells with the slimes. Unfortunately, both of my mages are limited with just three uses of these types of spells resulting in a lot of detours back to the inn for recovery whilst exploring. The lower levels of the cave contain large areas filled with many small rooms and treasure chests. In case you are curious about the treasures, the chests contain mostly little goodies like some money and armor pieces we already have. I did not exactly get the feeling of missing out if I did miss one of them. But back to our quest. It takes me and our heroes several hours of back and forth 
till we can present you with the one treasure that's relevant for our progress. And the monsters which guard it. Is it just me or do they look a bit like Cthulhu creatures? They not just look horrible, they are also very powerful attackers. The fight ends with both my mages down, and then my strongest fighter half dead as well. But we got the crown for our efforts. Time to leave this horrific place by running away from all fights that get triggered while escaping from the cave. Revived and patched up, we are able to make it back to the ruined castle. While we're on the way, how do you feel about it? I am very curious when it comes to our reward. I wonder if we will witness the transformation of the castle back to its former glory. Handing the crown over to the king, though, painfully makes me realize that we got tricked by Astos. Thanks to us, he now has the power to rule over the other elves in Alfheim. We cannot allow a devious monster like him to rule them. Uh-oh, not sure if fighting him was a good idea. He just cast a death upon Dan. Damn, I thought the spell had a chance to fail, but our fighter meets his fate. That's not a good start for our battle. Kane's attacks deal almost no damage. The aura does not affect the Dark Elf. Looks pretty bad for us. At least Vivi's spells can harm the monster. This means we have to do all we can to keep Vivi alive. First, June buffs our wizard with the inverse spell to hire us evading capabilities. While Astos debuffs his speed and upgrades his own with haste. June's try to silence him for this fails. Ignoring all the bad news, Vivi continues to spam his spells. Getting hit by Astos in revenge, turn after turn. Then, finally, one last Pyra spell and Astos is done for. Phew! The game really got me there. I did not expect a false identity. Leaving the victory screen, we find Astos' throne empty. It seems as if we got nothing for beating the evil being, but a look into our pockets will prove this initial assumption wrong. Astos was the thief who had stolen the crystal eye from Matoya, and now it's in our possession. I think we should bring it back to where it belongs. It's a long way back that I skipped for you. But it gets rewarded, not just with the gratitude of Matoya. No, she is so overjoyed that she gifts us with her finest medicine. That's wonderful. That should help us with a certain prince, shouldn't it? Thank you.
we sailed back to Alfheim. The tonic we got from Atoya probably is best at the hands of the guard watching the sleep of his sovereign. Our guess proves to be right. He knows how to administer it, bringing the prince back to the wake world. Finally, after five years of slumber. For him, it felt like a long nightmare, but now that it is over and our light warriors arrived as prophesied, he will stand by his oath and deliver the mystic key to us. Welcome, Viator, to Final Fantasy 1. You're hopping in at the moment our four warriors of light travel back to the place of their origins. In the previous part, we got our hands on a mystic key for setting an evil right. With this key in our hands, we will get access to some nice treasures that were promised to us. Sweet, sweet treasure! Long have we waited. But now your time to sparkle has come. Not one, but two treasure rooms await. I don't know what I expected, but nitro powder certainly wasn't among it. It's too much of a unique find to discard it as trash, though. As we are here already, let's check on King and Princess Sarah. Talking to them again reveals her having a crush on one of my warriors. I wonder, which one is it? This little detail is also another resemblance to Dragon Quest 1. But with Princess Sarah being way more modest, and not that pushy as Gwalen was. But time to move on. Since we settled the issues in the south, now should be a good moment to sail west and see what we can find on the other port we discovered last time. Another green land with deep forest awaits. At first, it appears as if there is nothing else but Mother Nature here. Yet, on a closer look, the entrance to a cave can be found in one of the mountain groups south. Look! This gotta be the city of the dwarves. Dwarves and elves, they feel so alien to me in the world of Final Fantasy, as later titles develop more and more unique races. Anyways, we get greeted with a friendly Laliho, <laughs> and catch a word regarding two types of rare materials, Adamantite, a legendary metal which would make for a fine sword, and the Levi Stone. A rock that is believed to enable anything to float. Both sound marvelous. The dwarfs lead us to one of their brethren named Nerik, a dwarf which is respected by all of them. We run into him in front of this large building. On our first word, he takes the nitro powder from us without asking. At least he thanks us for bringing it to him. With it he can continue his work on a canal. And off he goes. By the way, in the house are a lot of treasures and they even contain something more promising. May I introduce to you? the worm killer. It will look most handsomely on them. The canal Narek spoke about is just a few steps south of here. And with its completion, 
We are free to explore the ocean beyond the cage we have been in. See, we fit just neatly into the kennel. And I guess there will be no long exploration sailing over seemingly endless oceans here. As there is already a brand new port town to explore. Wow, this place is really run down. Everyone seems so poorly dressed as well, not to mention all these gravestones. So, so many gravestones. This must be Melmont, the town that suffers from the rotting earth and monster attacks. Interrogating the population, we learn that the monster causing all this chaos is a vampire who is leeching on the power of the earth crystal that's located somewhere in the south. The creature even came to the city and attacked the church, leaving it to ruins. They hope that our light warriors can bring its terror to an end and give light back to the crystal, because then life would return to the soil as well. We run into Dr. Une, a well-known person, according to his own word, and Jim, a dwarf who came here to investigate the rotting earth. After all, the ill phenomenon spreads as far as to the border of the dwarf's home. But all the research seems to be no help to the situation. Looks really sinister. We should take action as quickly as we can and face that vampire. But instead of the cavern of the earth, we stumble into this one. And into this. A rock titan, as I learned in Melmont. But there was no word about it talking. Apparently, we are not welcomed here. But maybe he will let us through if we find something it likes to eat. Well, for now there seems to be no way around it. So let's not bother with it for the moment and carry on. Further into the south lies another cave. This must be it then. It matches the description of being located on a peninsula in the south. And, like the zombie nest we left behind in the last episode, this cave is huge! and the enemies roaming it merciless. Among them are these earth elementals, who are real tanks, taking in so incredible amounts of damage before they go down. But at least they don't inflict any status damage. From the second level downwards, follow these labyrinths. They stay fairly easy to navigate through. It still takes quite some time to explore them. And all this time we are accompanied by these bats, who tend to fly in our path, requiring our heroes to push them away. What's with these bats anyways? They are always around where evil lurks. Though, this time we're hunting a vampire, so it's quite fitting. A level deeper and the bats even change their color. Down here the population really exploded, huh? They even have their own room. At the end of this floor awaits the vampire we were seeking to find. The creature blocks the way of our heroes. He won't surrender to us, as his goal is to keep the seal broken and the earth rotting. His reasoning seems to include something around the lines Every life has to come to an end eventually, however this is supposed to justify his actions in speeding up the process. The fight with him starts with a critical hit on Kane, getting him KO'd already. We're running into a pattern here, huh? Fighting bosses with just three of our four warriors of light. Silence has no effect, 
but we slow him down at least. The new sword done collected works great. And just three turns later, the vampire is slain. Time for looting. And we get something really great here. A star ruby. Something sparkly at last. But let's not forget what we came for. Let's repair the earth steel. That's why we're here after all. To help all the poor people above the ground. This altar might be it. But I expected a crystal. Pushing and running around it has no effect at all. But when I enter the menu to check if I got an item to use on it, it's clear to see that a stair is hidden beneath the altar. But whatever I do, I don't get it off. Well, I have no other choice than leave and regroup. As defeating the vampire had no, absolutely no effect on the village, we will return to the cave we found first. We will speak to the Titan again, in hope of a change of heart, now that the vampire is dead. But instead of the vampire, he noticed the ruby we found. No, 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 he eat it. My sparkle. At least it was tasty and enough to open the way for us. The treasure room we find as compensation holds some gill for us and a mithril helm, which I will add to dance equipment. We can exit the cave through here and just follow the path along the mountains into here. Apparently this serves as some sort of home? The people of Melmond spoke of a wise sage by the name Sada. That's him then I suppose? Sada revealed that the vampire we killed was not the real culprit behind all this mess. He gives our warriors of light a rod infused with the power of earth. It's supposed to open the way to the vampire's lair. That's what was missing to reveal the stair under this construct. And sure enough, it works just fine, leading us even deeper into the cavern. The way leads two more levels down. In here, we find another status inflicting enemy. May I introduce the innocent looking birds that can turn our heroes to stone with their pecs. I wasn't prepared for that. Warriors who turn into stone can do nothing. They are practically dead. Unlike paralyzes, this illness won't cure overturns. It takes a gold needle to get rid of it. Guess what I don't have. I save you the details of traversing all the way up to the surface and over the ocean just to buy a stack of them. To then finally make it to here. This is the final chamber, the home of the Earth Crystal. And as soon as our warriors come in touch with the orb, it breaks open and all the evil pours out. Finally, the leash who corrupted the power of the Earth reveals itself. Dan gets paralyzed immediately and therefore knocked out for the battle again. So we are down to three fighters. As usual. Almost funny by now. Oh, Diara works great. I could have thought of that, but there was just this one use left, as the slot is shared with the group here that I used to come down here. If 
Thankfully, Vivi has plenty of Blizzard spells left and froze them at the leash. Our Blizzra is answered with the same spell thrown back at our group. So the leech is a spellcaster too and deals damage to everyone on my side. This is bad. I don't have a strong group healing spell and just a couple of potions. If this goes on for say more than two turns, we are down. And the leech is resistant to June's silent spell. Kyogar, the strongest single target healing spell and the revival spell have three shared uses left. For this turn, we spend Kyogar on Vivi. I'm afraid Kain dies before June can cast the spell onto him and then it would be wasted. So let's save the revive spell for the next turn. This made my heart skip a beat. Thank god it's a single target spell. And well, since the leash uses Blizzra on us, maybe the opposite element will be a better choice against him? Woohoo! 158 damage! That's too much for it to handle. We won! By the way, with then still being paralyzed for the whole fight. The crystal has vanished. And the earth shakes if we step onto this, whatever this is. But nothing more, no message. And outside is still on this marshland. Did our efforts have no effect? Let's return to Melmont and check if something changed there. No, at least nothing visible. But when we talked to the people, some of them noticed a change in the earth. Some life has returned to it. Jim the Dwarf also noticed the changes and thanks us for our efforts. The ever so great Dr. Une, though, noticed nothing. A look into our inventory also proves that we saved the first crystal and brought its light back. After all, we beat this nasty leash and by that gave some hope back to Melmon's people. As we had settled our business in Melmont, we followed the rumor of an ancient civilization living somewhere in the north. Even though the rumors told us that the civilization was gone. We still set sail to discover whatever was left of them. The ocean and the lands beyond our group's home were still fairly undiscovered by us. Do you remember how surprised we were when we found out that the land of the Earth Crystal was physically connected to our homeland? There was just a large mountain separating the two. Anyways, the ocean was wide and it traveled to two new continents far. Many monsters attacked us, but we pressed on. From the shore, we spotted many points of interest. Towns, castles, islands full of holds, but no landing port. What a major disappointment. Did our mission fail? All seemed to lead us north, but as nothing could be reached, we returned to the water surrounding our home continent. We thought we knew this area kind of well by now, but there were ports undiscovered by us, hidden in the east behind the mountains. We landed on all three of them, yet two of them were empty promises, just some wildlife with no structures to explore.
The third one led us into a deep jungle filled with lots of snakes and these disgusting creatures. They came in large quantities, as if they guarded the small village far off the beaten path. Didn't the town remind you of another one we discovered while traveling with that hero through Dragon Quest 1? What was its name? Remoda? With the difference that Remoda was a bustling city, and this was a quiet and peaceful place neat and adored with the first flowers we saw on our journey. You could almost feel a soft breeze and hear some birds singing. It felt like a place for the warriors of light to stay and take a rest. We let them stroll around for the village. I don't remember which one it was, but one of them found a path into the woods that led us into a clearing with twelve sages, all with pink hair. They have waited there for our arrival to educate us on the four finds which were feeding on the elements. Their coming was prophesied long ago, and some of them had plagued the world already for 400 years. The one feeding on the power of the wind was the first that had appeared, followed by the one of water. The one we had just beaten, the Earth One, just had woken up with the forthcoming of our Warriors of Light. And now that we had beaten it, the One of Fire woke 200 years early. The Fire Crystal was the next we were directed to. I remember it being located rather nearby, within a volcano that goes by the name Gulk. Reaching it by foot was impossible though. Knowing of this, one of the sages gave us a canoe to row upstream and beat the find of fire, before he could burn everything to ash. I remember being really surprised to find the sage Lucan among the twelve. Who would have thought that we would find the legendary prophet Lucan himself? The one who prophesied our king the coming of the Light Warriors. Well, so much to our plans of resting. As companions of the warriors, we followed them towards Mount Gulk, past the labyrinth of river arms, hydras, and those lovely creatures. The travel after the volcano was already onerous, and as past experiences teach us, the dungeon ahead wouldn't be a walk in the park. Perfect spot for a camp. It was hot in there, lava everywhere, every step hurt. It was a terrible experience, draining on the life of all warriors of light. There was this giant treasure room just one level deep, taunting us with its many, many treasure chests. We got there eventually, but at what cost? The chests were a scam, nothing noteworthy, just gold and equipment we had already. But it had cost us all of our magic and almost our life as well to reach them. Down there the enemies were ruthless, some of them so dangerous that we decided it to be more wise to run instead of engage in a fight. The deeper we went, the more lava we encountered. It was ridiculous how much of it filled the corridors. Within all this heat and torture, we found a treasure room worthy of its name. With a chest containing the ice brand, a fine sword for Dan, and another chest guarded by this lava worm holding a matching shield. With these, exploring became a bit easier.
After exploring and mapping the area for hours, we finally reached the deepest point within the volcano. We've been nervous and anxious of what would lie ahead of us. No matter how carefully we planned the way down here, because of all the magma we had to sacrifice spells and potions. Another one of these beautiful crystals awaited us. Picking it up angered to find a fire. She already knew that her brother was slain by us. Wasn't it strange that the find only got mad because our actions ended her sleep early? Anyways, the beast promised to burn us to cinder as we engaged in battle. We got the initiative and June casted her protect spell onto Kane to increase his chances of survival with a stronger armor. Maybe we had wasted that, as Kane's attacks were poorly executed and failed miserably, especially in comparison with Dan's Icebrand. Merylith's first strike with her six blades taught us the true horror of her existence. Even if we had cured Vivi to his full health, he wouldn't have had a chance. Knowing better now, it's almost naive that I tried to heal June up in response to the shock, to stand a chance. Murdering our two mages, the snake creature turned her eyes on Cain, but Cain wasn't as easy to hit as the other two. Three of her blades missed, and Cain lived another round. Meanwhile, Dan enraged over his fallen allies and bursted into a fury. Normally one of these settled such issues, but not this time. Merylith took the hit and took revenge for it with a fire spell. Now we've been down to 1v1. Dan's armor was good and helped to withstand the creature's might, but for how long? This question became more apparent the more critical hits he stroke. Even with the fire shield, the turns he could survive became countable. How much could this beast probably take? I stopped counting. Then the final stroke. Then made it. All alone. The fire find was gone, so he fulfilled his duty by placing the crystal carefully back onto its altar. All alone, he emerged at the surface, with no option to revive his fallen team members. This meant that he had to make it back to the village all by himself. I remember that we gave him a night of rest in a cottage to prepare him best for this endeavor. He was our best fighter, so we could trust him with this task, even though the Hydras and Piranhas tried their best to get a hold of him. He made it! And with the help of the church, he brought our warriors back to life. The sages had nothing new to say regarding our victory, but then found a villager with news for us. Last time we encountered him, he was fast asleep, and his wife was complaining that he traveled all the time, and if he came home, all he did was napping. Well, this time he isn't napping, but he is thinking of traveling again to the north of here, into the cavern where he assumes to find the Levy Stone. But because of all the complaining of his wife, he stayed home this time. But we didn't. The Levy Stone was a familiar term, right? We heard of it from the dwarves. It was believed that the stone levitates every object. That's a thing worthy to investigate. We missed the cave the man was talking about as it was only reachable via another river. Now with the canoe, we just needed to row upstream to find it. We set up another cottage and stepped in. This time we only needed to follow the trail. 
There were no diversions, just a long and wiggling hallway, spiraling down into a room containing three treasures. One fairly easy to reach, another heavy guarded, and one obviously standing out. From the left one, we retrieved a fire blade, which was just perfect for the creatures roaming this icy cave. The one to the right was insanely protected by dark wizards. Another foe that frequently caused the death upon us, plus dazzling thundergas. It's a game of luck how many one encountered, but usually they came in devastating numbers. And I decided to literally hop on and come back later for it. I really hoped that the guarded chest wasn't the one with the levy stone. But if it were, what for would have been these holds? Back then, all I could do was take a jump into the uncertainty. Once down, there was no way to retreat from what was lying ahead. With limited resources and no option to save, believe me, this felt very daring. Similar to the lava inside the volcano, this place had ice puddles, which took care of us feeling very uncomfortable. Our first priority after coming down here was to find the shortest way out as quickly as possible, to be able to retreat whenever needed. This became even more pressing once you plundered that dragon vault. Those two vicious ice dragons guarding it nearly gave me a heart attack, plus the dark wizard who freely roamed the area. The cavern stayed true to its pattern of being less complex, allowing us in consequence to find the stair up fairly quickly. Okay, another floor. The more unfamiliar was lying ahead, the worse for us, as we could not properly assess how much we needed to save up on our resources to make it out alive. This new floor had one very prominent room right at its center, with another hole leading into even more uncertainty. At that time, we skipped it we first had to find a route out. To our surprise, the exit was literally just around the corner. This was important. With this knowledge, we could go back in and dare to make the jump. Look where we landed! Right in front of the treasure chest we could not reach before. Guarded by the Beholder, casting the kill spell. But it had missed then. If it had not missed, the fight might have looked very different. But this way, one Fandaka from Vivi and the following blow with Dan's flame blade were enough to finish the battle in our favor. Rewarding us with the Levy Stone. What with it now? We had no clue of where to go with it or what to do. I went back to the traveler who initially gave us the hint where to find it, but nothing. We've been traveling a lot before we finally ended up again in Elfheim. One of its elves once told us something around the lines, I can see the future sometimes. Well, that sometimes must just have had happened. Guided by his vision, we set sail to the last port on our home continent, one of those we found previously as empty. The elf spoke of something which is about to rise from the sands south of the crescent moon. I remember that Lucan was believed to have had traveled to that place, and we knew where the sage was. This tiny desert looked suspicious from the get-go. But now that we had the Levy Stone, we finally discovered its true purpose.
An airship. Who would bury this in the sands? And why? This wonderful tiny thing allows us finally to visit the countries up north. The lands which suffered from the fight of water and wind for more than 200 years. Under their devastation, what might be left of the land and its people? Well, surprisingly, way more than I ever imagined. But for today, let's concentrate on the story of this innocent creature and how important saving it became to us. For this adventure to take place, we first had to travel to Onrak, town of the Water Crystal Shrine. Great! We found the location of the next crystal already, or so I thought. Except we couldn't get to it, as it has been pulled down to the bottom of the ocean. I couldn't even spot a single trace of it at this harbor, I suppose. For someone searching for a way into the deep, this, at least to me, looked suspiciously similar to a submarine. Granted, a pretty primitive one made of a barrel, or maybe really just a barrel. The young lady in front of it had crafted it to transport herself down to the mermaids, which made the shrine their home. Mermaids? Apparently they lived there together with the find of water? And according to rumors, also with an ominous treasure people whispered about in the streets. If it wasn't the water crystal itself, what else might be down there? I like me some sparkly treasury. Unfortunately, the barrel alone wasn't sufficient on its own. The shrine had been drowned so deep that without a source of oxygen, the ocean would simply swallow us whole. The answer to our misery is tightly connected with the fate of a certain little being. I had never found her if it wasn't for the worry of a daughter for a father. All this around us certainly looks just like every other place on the world map, does it not? There is nothing outstanding to be spotted, but obviously I wouldn't bring us here if there's nothing to be seen. Within this wilderness is a campsite for the caravan of the girl's father and see what he got for sale. Quite pricey, but money we had plentiful of. This wasn't a regular item as it might been in other games. You can't use her for healing nor reviving, so why capture and sell her in the first place? She was just this beautiful and rare thing, contained in a ridiculously small cage. Her home was far, really far away. So far that I wondered how she came here in the first place. This is the highest up north place you can get. All the way up here lies Gaia. A city protected by this wall of mountains. Visitors like ourselves were rarely seen, if ever. It's here that we caught word of a fountain fairy that used to live in the town's spring. Yep, I got that too. We even ran into the one who caught and sold the tiny creature for a profit. How ruthless. But at least the guy realized he did wrong and felt remorse for his actions. We have arrived. Time to let her free. This is where she belongs. The poor thing. She was so scared in that narrow bottle for all that time. Back home, she gave us what only a fairy could harvest of the spring, an oxile. Rightfully, you might ask yourself what that is, or maybe you guessed it already by its name. 
The oxyl is a substance which permanently admits oxygen. Surely, with its help, we could operate a barrel um, submarine. I mean submarine from earlier. I know, we just got the oxyl and we could use it immediately to try out the submarine we discovered last time. But there is something else I have to show you first. You probably spotted him last time already. I mean, he is quite striking. The surprise is, he spoke. The great Bahamut himself promises new titles to those who pass his trial of courage. Yeah, that famous Bahamut. See why we should make this detour? I found this on my way back to the city of the water crystal. A bit suspicious, standing here all by itself, without any city or village nearby. This gives me flashbacks to the situation with Astos. And gone he is. Creepy. He even mentioned the crown we got for Astos, seemingly the entry fee for the trial of courage. Guess we are ready to try it. What awaited us was a labyrinth of teleportation pillars. And plenty of them. A guessing game of which to take. A wrong choice resulting in a zoom back to the start. The hallways were filled with zombified Minotaur and gigantic clay golems. But most terrifying of them all were these medusas. Status effects in general in this game are really frightening. June Stoner failed midst battle, so it came down to pure luck if our whole party solidified into stone or not. And the game of luck isn't really my turf. I had to try it again. Thankfully on the second attempt things went better and we reached the end of this maze. Our reward, the token of courage. A uh, red's tail? Really? Who wants such a thing? The next pair of dragons we got to see was the zombified couple who blocked our way out of this mess. Dan had just reached level 25 and June had cast for a white magic left over. Those two had no chance. A combination of Dan's blade stroke and June's magic took one round per zombie dragon. Two turns and we were free to go. But where to now? The castle was empty and the elder who welcomed us remained missing. Just a short fly away and we got to see this. And what the heck happened here? Looked to me like a testing ground for bombs. But that's not what they are. We're in Cardia, home of the dragons. Intelligent ones with ethics. Don't kill unless of a just cause. And of course, plenty of treasury. In their midst, their leader, Bahamut. He really is here from the first game on. We presented him the rat's tail and he kept his promise. Farewell, cute sprites. But we finally got promoted, a necessary step to teach my mages the highest level of spells. Among them, a teleportation spell. A safe escape out of dungeons, no matter how deep caught in you are. That's what I desperately craved. Two episodes in the past, we got an Oxile, 
a substance which permanently emits oxygen. This time we are ready to show it to the young lady with the self-made submarine. She seemed in tears. At last someone came. She had waited internally for someone like us. With the last wish on her lips, she vanished. This became a bit of a pattern. Everyone seems to turn into illusions lately. Here, deep down, the way only led up straight ahead, past those pillars. I made a turn to the left and navigated our group along these narrow paths. This time, there was not much of the usual back and forth, thanks to the teleportation spell I bought for June, which allowed me to be more bold in my exploration, as I knew I could escape at any point needed. This way, I stumbled directly into the crystal's chamber. The find was busy feeding himself with the surrounding water. He laughed at us as we approached, confident in his capabilities. In most fights with these finds, we lost all of our warriors except for Dan, so the first turn felt essential to prepare him best possible for a 1v1. He just got haste from Vivi as the first one fell already. One shot. 382 damage. Gosh. The next turn was June's with her proto spell, rising the armor of the rest of the crew. We will need it if we have to withstand such high damage. Turn 2. Dan's turn. A critical hit as to be expected from him. That's it. What? Already? For laughing so loud at us, this one died quick. As always, we returned the crystal to its altar, where it belonged, and got teleported back to Onrak. But wait, we missed something. What about the mermaids, and that ominous treasure we were supposed to find? This time we turned right. The stairway up to the city of the mermaids was just around the corner. So many of them. They were glad to see us. Without our help, the find of water would have continued to feed on the water crystal, ultimately leading them turning into foam. One of the mermaids told us about her friend, who once went up to the surface and never returned. Could that be the girl who built the submarine and pleaded us to save her kind? I hope she can rest peaceful now that the find is gone. This city was also the location of the ominous treasure, a Rosetta Stone, something special. The scholar in Onrak mentioned it. It is somehow connected with an ancient civilization of sky people. Speaking of sky people, there were rumors both in Onrak and Gaia regarding something falling from the sky. A girl in Gaia reported about a bright light flying west in the middle of the night. And here in Onrak someone witnessed something shiny falling from the sky. Onrak is located west of Gaia. We tracked the guy down who claimed to have seen it. He stayed with his statement. He thinks it was a robot. Why does he know what a robot is? According to him, it must have landed somewhere close to the waterfall up north. I already thought that the waterfall was a remarkable sight, but now with this hint, we investigated it a bit more thoroughly. A simple cave, just one path to follow. At its end, truly a robot, a friendly one. He gifted us a warp cube. A strange stone, 
with an assortment of colors swirling inside of it. We should take it and bring it to a flying fortress? Something bad is there. Something named Tiamat. I think he asked us to take care of that bad being. As I explored the city of Gaia, I came across some rumors regarding an ancient civilization of sky people living in the heavens. So naturally, when I heard this girl speaking of something moving west in the night sky, I first thought that she saw the flying castle of this legendary civilization. Since there was so much emphasis on this flying thing, I expected it to be the location of the last missing crystal and went out to catch up with it. But we know now that that was something else. Which doesn't mean that the castle doesn't exist. Do you remember that I said the Rosetta Stone we found in the Water Shrine was special? We will have to pay Dr. Una another visit. Yep, I know. He wasn't any help with the rotting earth problem, but this time he might come in handy. I met his brother in Onrak and learned from him that he's a scholar of languages. He was stuck with his Lufanian studies and in search for the Rosetta Stone to decipher it. He's a good teacher too, it seems. We just learned another language. But wait. You might ask what for we need to speak Lufenian. Well, there is one town I have been withholding from you. It's a really hard to reach place, as there is only this one spot for our aircraft to land on. Plus, up to this point it made no sense to visit this remote city. Everyone here just spoke this gibberish. But as we speak the same gibberish now, we discover some interesting things. These people are the descendants of the Sky People of Legend. They got power from the Wind Crystal, which drove their technology up to the edge of space. 400 years have passed since then. Their era ended with the forthcoming of the find Tiamat. They tried to force him back but failed and found refuge here. If you saw the last episode, this name will sound familiar to you as well. From our visit with the Lufanians, we got a chime, a door opener to what lies in this desert. The Mirage Tower, an outstanding sight. I've been here several times before, hitting against the wall, trying different items in front of it, obviously with no success. This tower looked so primitive and old from outside, such a heavy contrast to its inside. The place is not only filled with 400 years old machinery. No, there's another one of these. Our side confuses him. He looks similar to his masters. He's not the only one in here. The sky people built them. Maybe to fight Tiamat? This one reports of one of his kind having escaped with the warp cube. So he came from here. The warp cube is what we need to operate a teleporter on the third floor. Oh. Are we in space now? I mean, they said they were on the edge of space. And you gotta agree, this looks like a satellite, or not? Well, now that I think about it, the space theme is something reoccurring in Final Fantasy games. From here, we get a look down on Earth. We see a flow of energies drawn towards the Chaos Shrine, where we fought our first real battle. We should Definitely check that out once we are done here. The next floor feels like a bad joke. Oh no, Dragon Quest 2 had something similar. Repeating hallways terrify me. 
I was prepared for a torturous search for the exit, but I got lucky. At the end of this hallway, Tiamat awaits us. Our warriors are exhausted. It's a long and dangerous way up here. June's healing spells are almost completely depleted. I have a bad feeling about this. But let's give it a try. Ow, oh, e-damage! That's a nightmare. Especially with no proper healing options. I have nothing to hold against this. Vivi and June are hurrying to get haste and prota out. Their health drops below 100. That's it. I pushed too far. Both casters are dead. And Kane follows. I feel like a lunatic making Dan attack turn after turn, while watching his HP falling and falling. Phew! But sometimes you just have to be stubborn. This victory was way too close to feel any good about it. Another time where Dan has to put the crystal alone back to its altar. Before we are safe, he also has to cross the desert alone until he reaches our Lufanian aircraft. While he is on the way to the church to revive our fallen warriors, let's end this episode. I know. This is not a Chaos Shrine, but we want to be properly prepared for the final, right? And our outer space experience brought us a piece of adamantite. What a waste not to put it to use! Ah, Excalibur, his finest work. A strong companion for the road ahead, yet on its own, not enough. It's been a long time. The ruins of our first fight. The knight who turned to the dark side. The fifth crystal. The dark one. And five bats. While we're getting teleported 2000 years into the past, let's briefly discuss those bats. The descendants of the sky people shared their legend with me. Before us, Five warriors have been sent out to find the puppeteer behind the four finds, but they never returned. Five bats where we fought Garland. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Those are real roadblocks with their poisonous gas. Our warriors of light are forced down to their knees. Even with the Excalibur, Dan can only do so much. Several attempts went by till I managed to sneak past them into here. The room is guarded by the Beholder, protector of this slate, pouring with evil. At this point, the game expects from us that we remember our first hour with it. Since the start, we have something in our inventory which can shatter the gateway of evil. The loot of the princesses of Cornea Castle and its song. What follows are four longish levels, home of the four finds. 2,000 years before we had beaten them, so we gotta do it again! Hooray! And this time in a row! No saving, nor MP regenerating in between. We can return to the past to patch our four up, sure, but we always return to a time where the four finds are alive. It's an MP draining ordeal, with a light of hope place just short before the rematch with Tiamat. Masamune is a game changer for me. It's the only sword Kane can equip. 
But of course it's still no protection against this beast's attacks. Tiamat stays a terrifying threat. And not the last we got to face. Time to meet Garland again. A version which was saved by the energy the four finds seized from the crystals. A version brought here to send the finds out again, ultimately luring us here over and over again. To be killed by Garland time and time again. We're stuck in an endless time loop. What a promise, but we can't let that stop us. We start with June's holy spell and continue with Vivi's blizzard. The two make okayish damage, but nothing comparable with Dan or even Kane. I started to count the damage up, nervous of how long it might take to the second phase. 500... 800... 1200... Still phase 1, and that earthquake took Cain from us. 1700... Vivi's damage is almost cute. 1900... Holy, how much more? 2000... Done? The second phase? Please not. We broke the time loop. 2,000 years of Garland's hatred, over. A war which was started by a misunderstanding, boiling up to the birth of the Four Finds. Now that it's over, our warriors return to their time. Princess Sarah and her mother Queen Jane await us, together with Garland? And no word of the king. With our return, the four lost their memory. But how can we ensure then that it's not happening again? Our journey ends here, but maybe the one of someone else just begins starting another time loop. Thank you for coming here with me. Can you guess what's up next? We will join a young red-headed adventurer on his first journey. Hope to see you there. Until then, bye.